All right, I'm here. Is this working? I don't know whether I'm on or not. I guess this is going. It says people are watching, so it must be working. Is that accurate? Somebody say something in the chat or whatever. Here, okay. Uh, this is obviously a, a strange thing for all of us uh, to be doing this, the far point virtually and Zooming and Discording, whatever it is that everybody's doing. I'm going to make an assumption that might be false, but I'm going to make it anyway. And that is that since it's Farpoint, since I've been at Farpoint a bazillion times, uh, that a lot of you have heard me before, which is fine. Um, and, and therefore, rather than just be just going on and, and probably saying the same thing I've said over and over and over again, uh, I want to do a little more, you know, Q and A kind of thing. So please uh, ask questions. You can go to the Q and A thing, and I'll see the questions, and I'll answer the best I can, and that'll direct the discussion. I think more than me just yammering on and on and on. But if I don't get uh, lots of questions, I'll just yammer on and on anyway. In case anybody is new to this, uh, what my connection to to all of this is is that I uh, developed a bunch of languages for Star Trek, uh, starting with a little bit of Vulcan for Star Trek II, and then Klingon, which I guess is the big deal one, for Star Trek III uh, and beyond. And I've worked a little bit on all the, all the various series. Uh, did I ever work on Voyager? I, wonder, I, can't, I can't remember um, whether I did directly or not, but anyway. Uh, and on all the other ones up to and including uh, Discovery, not, not Picard. Uh, and I worked a teeny tiny bit on Lower Decks that nobody ever talks about. Not, not that they don't talk about Lower Decks, they don't talk about what I did. Um, and that's that. Uh, it's a, been a very strange sort of, sort of adventure. I'm seeing, I'm seeing some comments in the chat, but if you put them in the, in the Q&A thing, that'll, that'll work. Uh, better. Um, so let me just talk about how I got into this at the very beginning, and, and, and then we'll go from there. Um, prior, prior to whatever I did, um, the languages in, in science fiction in general, science fiction movies and things like that in general, uh, were, were pretty much ignored, not entirely. Pretty much, you know, that general technique was just making up gobbledygook that was based on the sounds and syllables and so on, and in whatever languages the speaker, the writer, director, producer happened happened to speak or the actor. Uh, every once in a while, they get a little bit more uh, focused on all of that, um, but mostly not. Uh, sometimes they would ignore it altogether. It's very common, as you know, to zoom all over the galaxy or the universe or something and everybody is speaking English. Uh, nobody seemed to be bothered about that for a long time. Uh, Star Wars has an interesting technique that they do, which is they, they, they did pay attention to the languages. They made up some things that sounded pretty cool, but they don't mean anything for the most part. Um, they, what the basic technique that they used was to listen to it's an English language film, so listen to non-English languages and kind of pretend to imitate them a little bit and mix them with some other ones, but not worry about whether they got it exactly right and not worry about whether some a real word or two crept in there. Um, so they you know they have languages you know based on on uh, some South African, South African, South American languages, Central American languages, and things like that, some some Mongolian languages. Uh, in, in one of the newer movies, the, the, there's the Kanji Club people, and their languages are based on some Indonesian languages and so on. Uh, actually creating a language with, with, with grammar and consistent vocabulary and all that stuff, that predates me. The earliest version of that that I'm aware of, although there, there may be more, was for a kid's TV show in the 70s called Land of the Lost. 
where a father and his two kids uh, somehow end up in a place filled with cave people and dinosaurs and the cave people called the Pakuni talk their own language. And that language was developed by a woman named Victoria Framken at UCLA. And the idea was that it would have consistent vocabulary and grammar and all that stuff. In fact, the plan was that they'd introduce a little bit more vocabulary, a little bit more grammar as the as it went along so that by the end of a year or two, people would carry on a short little conversation in the language and it would work. They never developed it that much, so it, so it didn't happen. There's been a couple of other things since then, but the next real, uh, um, at least you know, in terms of big time Hollywood, developed language was Klingon and that was for Star Trek III. There was a little bit of Klingon uh, there's never, there was no Klingon in the original TV series. There was Klingons, but they never spoke their language. They referenced it in Trouble with Triples. They say that half the quadrant is learning Klingonese, uh, but they don't speak it themselves. They only speak English. And the very beginning of Star Trek, the motion picture, uh, is, 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 you know, is there's three Klingon ships going by and we see inside of one of them and the captain, commander, whatever his title is of that ship, is barking out commands in Klingon, he's saying something, and there's subtitles. So that's the real beginning of the Klingon language. And those lines were developed by John Polville, who was one of the producers of that film, and James Doohan, who played Scotty. They're the two, the two main guys. A little bit of help from a guy named Harmut Scharf, who developed the Vulcan for that film. We can get back to that if you want. Uh, and it was all spoken by Mark Leonard, who normally played Spock's father, but in this case, he played a Klingon. And he, uh, he said all that stuff. That was the beginning. Now, how much uh, the, the, the Klingon that Mark spoke resembles the Klingon that, that Jimmy and, and John Pobo created? I don't know. I don't know how much innovation there was on this part. Uh, and my entry to the whole thing was for Star Trek III, where we decided, okay, for Star Trek III, Harv Bennett, who was the, the producer writer, Star Trek III said, I want the Klingons to have a real language. And we decided that in order to make it sound like a real language, it had to be a real language. In other words, follow all the language kind of linguistic kind of rules. And that was the beginning of, of Klingon. Ah, and here's some, a couple of questions. So let's go again. Let, let, let's let this thing go by questions as much as we can. Uh, so in, in order of appearance here, it says, it says, can you talk about working with Christopher Plummer? Ah, and, have, and who have you worked with on Discovery? Yeah, Christopher Plummer. I worked with Christopher Plummer on, on Star Trek VI. He was the main speaker of Klingon uh, for that film. And the first time I met him uh, was in his hotel. I, I told this story to some, to some people, it was in his, hotel, which was in Beverly Hills. So I went over there. Uh, I remember he ordered tea from room service. And we sat down very civilized to discuss Klingon. Uh, and we went over the lines a little bit, uh, that we did much more later on as this filming went along. But I remember he said to me that he wanted to be really, really comfortable uh, speaking the Klingon lines. And the reason was, he says, I'm a Klingon. And if I'm having trouble speaking a language, it should be English, not Klingon. Klingon should flow uh, very fluidly. And if there's stumbles, it should be in English, which I thought was, was, a, was a good comment. That said, as we started working the film, you know, when, when you make a movie, when anyone makes a movie, the, the, every day there's revisions to the script. And a lot of times that affected the Klingon. And the, the, the way it would affect it, it was affected mostly in Star Trek VI is that Klingon lines, lines that were supposed to be spoken in Klingon would disappear as we were going along. Uh, they obviously didn't all disappear. Uh, and, and every once in a while one was added, but for the most part, they were, there was fewer and fewer. So I don't know what that was all about, uh, but some was, they, they stayed in. So, you know, you know one, of, one of my thoughts was, you know, someone is complaining, they don't like speaking Klingon. So I thought maybe that's Christopher Plummer, but that's not the case. It's not the case because I think he ended up liking speaking Klingon um, because he started calling me Mark all of the time. Uh, 
in, in all kinds of discussions about, about various things. Uh, there's one Klingon line in Star Trek VI uh, that Christopher Plummer is partially responsible for. He's certainly responsible for the shape of it, if not, if not the existence of it. And that's to be or not to be. Because in the original script for Star Trek VI, there's lots of quotes from Shakespeare, uh, some to be spoken in English, some to be spoken in Klingon. I, most of them, if not all of them, to be spoken by Christopher Plummer, although I don't remember that for sure. Uh, and some of those lines disappeared, especially the Klingon ones. One of the lines that was not in there originally in Klingon was to be or not to be. I can't honestly can't remember if it was originally there in English, um, but it was not originally there in Klingon. And I arrived on the set one day uh, in the morning. And the first person I happened to encounter was Nicholas Meyer, who was the director, writer for Star Trek VI. And he says, I need one more line from you. I said, OK, what's that? He said, to be or not to be, which, of course, fit in with this, with this movie. And what I said was, OK. And what I thought was, oh, no. Because I make a big stink about the fact that in Klingon, there's no verb to be. So all I had was or and not, basically. But if they wanted to be or not to be, and we had to come up with to be or not to be, so I thought a little bit. I said, well, what if it, what if it means to live or not to live? And Nick said, yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Go, go, go tell Chris. Now, Chris, of course, is Christopher Plummer. Um, so the way to say to be or not to be or to live or not to live in Klingon, there's all kinds of different ways to, that that could have been done, but I kind of did it in a very simple way, which is live or live not. Now, when I did Star Trek III, which is the, the beginning of the, of the Klingon that I did, uh, no one had ever heard Klingon before, except for the you know half a dozen words or whatever in the motion picture, and those weren't one for one translators. No one was quite sure what they were anyway. Um, so as we were filming Star Trek Three, if someone made a mistake, one of the Klingon speakers made a mistake, but it still sounded cool to me, I'd say, "Oh, that's fine," and make a note to myself that even though I intended for it to be this, now it's going to be that, because um, no one knew except for me. After Star Trek III came out, I wrote this book called The Klingon Dictionary that people bought. So now people are paying attention to this thing. Um, so now I had to follow the rules and the, and, the, and the words that were in the book. So, and that made it harder actually. When it was Star Trek V, it was much harder to make up, the, make up the lines than it was for Star Trek III because I had to pay attention to myself and I'm, did some things that I probably shouldn't have done, but I'm stuck with it, it's in the book. So anyway, for Star Trek VI, for to be or not to be, uh, the word for or is pah, the word for not is bad, it's not actually a word, it's a suffix that negates the previous thing. Uh, and the word for live is yin, yin. So to be or not to be, to live or not to live, I just went live or live not. Yin pah, yin bet. So go over to Christopher Plummer, who says, I understand you have a new line to teach me. I said, yes, he says, okay, say it. I said, okay, it's yin pa yin bet. And he goes, yin, yin? He says, that's too wimpy. Now that's not what he said, that's, that's what he meant. And, and since this is a whole new weird virtual thing, I'll tell you exactly what he said to see if this makes any sense to anybody. As it turns out, the day before, the day before that, the to be or not to be line, uh, he and I were talking about this, that, and the other thing. And one of the things we were talking about was The Goon Show. Now, The Goon Show was a radio show on the BBC in the 1950s. Maybe it crept into the 1960s. There was a comedy show that, that basically predates and sets, <clears throat> set into motion the kind of humor uh, that was done in Monty Python and some other things. Uh, it was three guys doing, there was a few other people too, but three main guys in the Goon Show, which was uh, Spike Milligan, who was the kind of comedic genius, uh, Harry Seacombe, who was a West End star, like a Broadway star in London, and who was well known in, in that world. 
and Peter Sellers, the Pink Panther Peter Sellers. That was, was the, the three of them. They did the Goon Show, and they were very funny and it was very popular. And they had one record, phonograph record, that came out during the run of the Goon Show. There was a minor hit uh, in England on, on, on British radio, and I guess people went to record shops and bought it and stuff. And the name of the song was the Ying Tong Song. And the lyrics of the Ying Tong Song basically, there's a bunch of other stuff, but the chorus was Ying Tong, Ying Tong, Little I Po, Ying Tong, Ying Tong, Little I Po, Ying Tong, Ying Tong, Ying Tong, Little, it was like that. It went on. Anyway, Christopher Plummer and I were talking about the Goon Show and, 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 and so on. So I go to him and say, to be or not to be is Yin Pa, Yin Be. And he said, that's the Goon Show. Because he's hearing, Ying tong in the light po, ying tong, ying tong, ying pa, ying pa, ying tong, ying tong. He says, change it, you gotta change it. So then what am I gonna change it to? Because uh, I'm stuck, it's can't be to be or not to be. So, I, and, then, and if live won't work and I can't change live to be another word because it's in the dictionary. So I said, well, what if it's, what if instead of saying yin pa, what if we should say tach pa, tach pa. And he goes tach. Tach is good, Let, let's keep tach. And tach, up until that moment, was a suffix that you slap on a verb that means to continue doing whatever the verb is. So, you know, to walk plus tach means to keep on walking, to continue walking. So I kind of made it be a, a, a full verb instead of just a suffix. So tach means to go on, to continue, to endure. So tach, pach, tach, bet means to continue or not to continue, to go on or not to go on. And that's where that line where that line comes from. And it would have been different if Christopher Palmer and I hadn't been talking about the goon show of all things. The way that line actually, I had no idea at the time where the line was gonna come up in the movie because again, it was originally there, but in the page revision that finally came out, it was in the, in the dining room scene where the Klingons and the Federation, the, the Enterprise crew gets together and gets drunk, I guess. Um, and the leader of the Klingon Empire says, I'd like to propose a toast to the undiscovered country. Everyone has kind of a blank stare. And Mr. Spock says, you know, Hamlet, Act 3, Scene 1. I might have got those numbers wrong, you know, because it's part of the to be or not to be speech. And the, uh, the leader of the Klingon Empire says, you know, you can't really appreciate Shakespeare till you've read him the original Klingon. Uh, as, as, as written in the script, Right after he says that, Christopher Plummer's character, General Chang, says in English, to be or not to be, and then some other stuff. And where they stuck in the, the Klingon one is they stuck it in right there. But as they filmed it, it was somewhere else. I can't remember where. It was someone else, somewhere else in the scene. And they, they kind of moved it all around. So the original dialogue Christopher Plummer was saying in English is still there, but it's moved, it's moved later on. Um, yeah, we filmed that scene over and over and over and over and over again. So by the time it was over, everybody remembered how to say to be or not to be in, in Klingon. Um, so yeah, Chris, Chris Robon was great. The, uh, I saw him a couple of times since then after the filming. He did a, a one person show about John Barrymore that toured the country a bit. And I saw it when he did it here in, in Washington, DC. And went to see him afterwards. And in the meantime, between between the time of Star Trek VI and the time I saw him in that in that show, he did a, a video game thing called I forget what it was called Klingon Academy Klingon something, where he plays Chang again, but it's like a, like a prequel because it's before he lost the eye, before General Chang lost the eye, and all that. And he speaks Klingon in that. I had nothing to do with that particular game, and he told me that he wished I had because I guess it was, it was <laughs> rough going or something uh, to, to do that. So that's Christopher Plummer. And there's probably other things I'm not thinking of. But Christopher Plummer was great. He was really, really good to work with you. He, he took the thing very, very seriously in, in, a, in a very positive way. Uh, the rest of the question was, who have I worked with on Discovery? In person, I've worked with nobody uh, because, because of the pandemic thing. Uh, Discovery season one is filled, <clears throat> filled with Klingon, as you know, if you've seen it. And I did not work on that. I did not, it's all, it's all my grammar and it's all my vocabulary, but I did not do the actual translations 
for the various lines of dialogue. It was done uh, almost entirely by a woman named Robin Stewart, who is a superb, and that's, that's putting it mildly, speaker of Klingon uh, from, from Vancouver. A little bit of it was done by a, a guy from Indiana named Alan Anderson, who's also a terrific speaker of Klingon. So they did, they did a great job. They, they did all of the work um, based on what I've done. I was in touch with Robin as this was going on, but I didn't do it. She, she did it all. Uh, and only in very, very rare instances did she run into a brick wall where, where she could not find any way to say what needed to be said uh, using the existing vocabulary that, that I'd provided. So I made up a couple, three new words for, uh, for discovery and gave them to Robin. Uh, so they're, incorpor they're incorporated into the thing. Um, interesting side note about, about playing on discovery. Uh, for, for the first season of Discovery, it's not true for the, for the other ones, the later ones. Uh, in, for Discovery in, a, in the US was shown on CBS All Access, which is still CBS All Access. And I don't know when it turns into Paramount Plus, but it was CBS All Access. And in Canada it's shown on a, on a, a streaming system or a cable system up there, I forget what it is, but everywhere else in the world, it was on Netflix. And for Netflix internationally, you can choose subtitles in different languages to watch the show. So if it's an English language thing and you want to see it with French subtitles, you click on something. If it's a German title, a German language thing you want to see with English subtitles, you can do that. And for Star Trek Discovery season one, if it was, if you chose, you could watch it, the whole show. It was an English language show, mostly. You could watch with German subtitles, French subtitles, whatever and also with Klingon subtitles. The entire first season, not just when they were speaking Klingon, the entire first season was subtitled in Klingon. Uh, and that work was done by a guy in Germany named Lee van Litar, who's another expert speaker of Klingon. And since he was translating all of the English dialogue into Klingon, right? Not the dialogue spoken by Klingons in Klingon, but all the English dialogue spoken by everybody into Klingon, he encountered a lot of vocabulary he didn't have like mycelial something, anyway. So we, he and I had a lot of discussions and a lot of new vocabulary was created for the, for the subtitles, but not for not just a teeny bit that is spoken down. Um, my involvement with, with Discovery came later and not, for, and not for Klingon. I still haven't done anything about Klingon for Discovery. Uh, so the, the first thing was a little bit of Kelpian for those Star Trek short things. And for those I didn't, did I work with anybody? Yes, yeah. I, uh, at that point I had not yet worked with Doug Jones. Um, but I worked, and oh, I, and when I say work with, everything was remote already. Everything was, was on Skype and stuff like that. So I didn't, again, I didn't, I didn't, it wasn't in physical contact with anybody. Um, so why am I blanking on the name of Giorgio, the actress? Because she was wonderful. Anyway, worked with her on a little tiny bit of Kelpian. Um, and then as, as it went on in, in season uh, three, in season two, there was, there was some more Kelpian. And I worked with some of the actors a little bit, but not with Doug Jones. Uh, in season two, in season three, <clears throat> in season three, I did work with Doug Jones via Skype or something, um, and uh, some of the some of the other actors speaking Klingon. I also work with David Ajala on Quajian or whatever his language is called, uh, which I did. Uh, and there's a guy at the beginning. I can't, can't remember season which is which. I guess season. There's some guy at the beginning, and yeah, at the beginning of season three, uh, there's some guy who wants to he, he wants to get uh, Molly. Molly's that big giant worm thing, um, uh, and he wants to capture capture Molly, but he gets he gets blown up at, the, at the, pretty early on. But he has he has a lot of stuff to say and. It, I worked on him and they, they did some kind of filtering with him too. So he sounds very, very strange. His language actually sounded strange 
without all the filtering. But anyway, so that's who I've worked with uh, on Discovery Bell, all by, all by uh, Michelle Yoth. Yes, thank you. All by, all by uh, remote control. All by thing. And it was very weird because sometimes I'd be in one place, the actor would be in another place, the engineer would be in another place, but somehow in post production, they got it, they got it all together. Ah, okay. So another question here says, what was it like to essentially improvise the grammar and tenses and claim it to match the spoken word to avoid needing to do another take? There wasn't that much of that, but there was a bit. Uh, in Star Trek II, which is the first bit of, of language stuff I did, there's a scene where they speak Vulcan, short little scene where Spock and Sabak talk to each other that was originally filmed in English and they decided to change that into Vulcan. And that's, that was, as I said, the first thing I did. And that was entirely uh, lip syncing. But it was also entirely at that time, entirely gobbledygook because I wasn't worried about vocabulary and grammar. I was just worried about making this, the, the new sounds match the lips that were already there. In Star Trek III, uh, in preparation for that, I made up all the Klingon dialogue where it said that a Klingon is supposed to be speaking Klingon. And I made up all the Klingon dialogue where it said a Klingon is supposed to be speaking English to, to another Klingon, not to Captain Kirk. Uh, and the reason for that was so that while we were filming, if someone said, hey, why is this Klingon talking English to this other Klingon? He should be talking Klingon. I could say, yes, here, here's the line, go ahead. As opposed to, oh, let me go back and think about that. They used zero of those lines, but they did help you know, flesh out the language and stuff like that. Um, but after filming, you know, once we were in post-production, then lo and behold, there was a few Klingon lines there were lines spoken by Klingons that were originally spoken in English that they decided should be spoken in Klingon. So now I had to do this lip syncing thing to, uh, so to match up the lips of the English with, with Klingon. Now for Star Trek III, that was not too tough because no one had heard Klingon before, really. So I could say anything. I didn't have to worry about the grammar. I could make up new grammar to match the lip movements, essentially make up new vocabulary to, ma to match the lip movements. As I say, there wasn't, there wasn't that much of that. So, so it wasn't so bad. By the time Star Trek six, or Star Trek five and six came out, uh, then I did have to worry about that because the dictionary was out and people would pay attention. And I had grammar and uh, vocabulary that I had to match, but I didn't have to worry about it except a teeny tiny bit. In Star Trek six, there's a lot of there's a little bit, I'm saying two things. There's a lot of random Klingon dialogue. What I mean by that is, especially when the, when the Klingon ship is under attack and they lost the gravity and all this and that, there's all kinds of shouting all over the place, but you're not, there's no subtitles. So it doesn't have to match with anything. And there's a little bit of uh, David Warner floating around, Gorkon floating around when he said some stuff in English that we had to turn into Klingon. Um, and I can't remember whether it's subtitled or not, but I did worry about matching grammar vocabulary a bit for that. But this is a teeny tiny bit. Where it came up the most was actually in uh, the second J.J. Abrams Star Trek movie, um, Star Trek Into Darkness, which is the only one that has Klingons in it. The first movie had, had um, Klingons in it that were cut out, but the second movie has, has Klingons in it. Uh, and they speak, all the, all the Klingon dialogue is just in, in one scene and, and, and it's spoken mostly by Uhura. That wasn't the way it was originally written. Originally there was a lot more dialogue back and forth but the way it got, got cut. So I uh, didn't work with the actors but I created the dialogue for that film. And months later, I got an email or phone call or something from, from the production company and they wanted to know if I could do something, because they changed that scene so much. They shortened it and they moved things around. So something, you know, so something that used to be used to be over here, one, two, three is now one, three, two. Uh, they would cut a sentence in half, you know, the Klingon or, or Hura in this case would say half a sentence, then they would cut to something else. And it was all in Klingon. 
I want, and they made up new subtitles for the new version, but of course the two new subtitles did not match the originally spoken Klingon because it was all reordered and jumbled up and cut in half and stuff like that. So what they wanted to know is, could I make up Klingon dialogue that matched the lift movements that were already filmed and meant what the new subtitles said? And my initial response was, I don't know. So what they did is they sent me the scene so I could, I could look at it. Uh, it was they sent it to me over the internet in some amazingly encrypted way that you know that that I'm sure the NSA could not crack and stuff like that. But anyway, so I looked at it and, and for Uhura's lines, I recognized the original lines, even if they were in half or in the wrong place. But I said, okay, I see what's going on here. And realized, yeah, I could do that. Now the trick was that I could make up new vocabulary as much as I wanted because I, I get to do that. But I could not make up new grammar because the grammar is in place. The grammar doesn't, you don't make up new grammar as you're going along when you, when you carry on a conversation or invent a new device or something. You might make up a, you know, a new word for a thing, but you don't make up how to make a plural or something like that. So I said, okay, I can see, I can see what I can do. I can see I can, I can do that for, for her lines. And the only other spoken line was spoken by a Klingon. And uh, I listened to his line, and after his first syllable, I had no idea what he was saying. That didn't sound like anything that I made up. So I looked back, and all the stuff that I'd sent them, and I said, no, that's not that. Even if he's mispronouncing it badly, I didn't send them that. It doesn't even sound, when I'm listening, it doesn't even sound like Klingon. It sounds like somebody talking backwards. Said, oh. So I looked at the lines that I sent, and I figured, picked one, and I wrote it out phonetically backwards and listened to the line, and that was exactly what it was. They, they, they were playing it backwards. And I called them up, I said, are you playing the scene backward or this line backwards? And they said, yes. I said, why? And they said, it looks better. And we knew we were gonna change the audio anyway. So I had to make a Klingon dialogue that matched, you know, Klingon grammar and, uh, and so on, that matched the lip movements of some guy talking Klingon backwards. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, that's never been done before or since for any language, but, but maybe so. Um, yeah, the original question said, said, you know, making a grammar and, and, and so on and Klingon to avoid needing to do another, it was avoid needing to do another take. It was avoiding to do another take when we were already in post-production, so we're not about to do other takes. It was, you know, everyone had already gone to bed. Um, so we had to, had to do it some other way. So that's that one. Here's a question. If a Klingon captain wanted to order his helmsman to maintain standard orbit, would he take the verb for orbit and add the task suffix? Yeah, keep orbiting, continue orbiting. Yes, exactly right. Good for you. You get an A. So that was, that's done, that's done. Who was the worst alien you had to work with? Ha <laughs> ha. Who was the worst alien? Um, none of them was the, was, was the worst alien. Uh, I assume by that you mean who was the actor who was the least easy to deal with or something like that. All of the actors I've had to deal with have been, have been great. With, without exception, having said that, there's one exception which I'll come back to. Um, they were really interested in doing it, really interested in doing it right, some more so than others. Uh, Christopher Lloyd, for example, wanted to know not just how to pronounce the words and stuff, he wanted to know what he was saying. Uh, how does the grammar work? What does the vocabulary mean? And things like that. Uh, some of them didn't want to get into it that far, some did, um, but worked very hard on getting the pronunciation right, so it was very fluid and comfortable and things like that. Uh, some of them were better students than others. There was one actor in particular who will go nameless, but it wasn't a, not a major actor who to this day, I'm not sure quite what he was saying, but anyway. Uh, some of the actors who, who wanted it so much because that was their only spoken line in the film. So they only got to say one line and it happened to be in Klingon. They wanted it right. Some of them wanted more Klingon lines because the way it works, uh, in Hollywood, it is, is if you have more than X lines, then your pay goes up. And they thought that if they mumbled some more stuff in Klingon, their pay would go up. I don't know if it did or not. 
there was a, a lot of throwaway lines like that. The, the one exception that I mentioned, and then and, and, and it's, it's awkward to say that, or, or, or imprecise to say that because it wasn't a person who was difficult to deal with at all. Uh, but during the filming of Star Trek VI, part of my job was to talk to all the actors who had anything to say in Klingon. Uh, besides Christopher Plum, but the others, uh, there was a few other speakers of Klingon. Um, and one of them was the woman who played Azet Bor, right? The daughter of Gorkhan, who became the clan commander after Gorkhan is killed and all this and that. And I hadn't worked with her at all prior to her, uh, you know, for in the days leading up to when she had to film the scenes where she spoke Klingon. Uh, it just, it just never came up somehow or other, you know, no one, no one ever set us up together. And I heard through the rumor mill that she didn't think she had to work with me, that she thought she was fine. I don't know if that's true or not. Um, but someone said, no, you have to work with Mark, you have to work with Mark. So they set up an appointment for me and go to work with her. So we sat down together and I said, okay, say, say your line. And she said it and it was beautiful. She said the second line and it was beautiful. She was absolutely right. She did not have to work with me just on the basis of the tapes that I'd sent out. I think then it was still tapes tapes that had sent out in the written transcript and stuff, she got it, she got it. Uh, so it's, it's not that she didn't wanna work with me, she didn't have to work with me. And she was absolutely right about that. Uh, I have another question. Have you been approached for use for Klingon for real world purposes like military codes? No, uh, I have not. I know that Klingon has been used for all kinds of funny things. I got, once I got a, a was it? text and email. I can't remember what the technology was at the time. Uh, but it was from it was from Quantico. It was from the FBI. Uh, and they said that they had a phrase that they were trying to figure out what language this was and what it means. And someone got the idea that it might be Klingon or Vulcan or something. So they wanted to send it to me to see if I could identify it. And they sent it to me. And I remember the technology, it was a while ago, the technology they sent it to me via fax. Uh, and it wasn't anything. It wasn't anything that I recognized at all. Uh, so I, I said that, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know what it is. Uh, I don't know whether it was, it was from the FBI. That, that's, that's true. Whether it was from the real FBI, what I mean by that is, was it involved with some kind of investigation that they were doing? Or was it training? Because Quantico is training also, where they do training for the FBI. So it might have been a training exercise, not a real thing. Um, but in any event, it wasn't Klingon or Vulcan or anything that I could recognize, with whatever it was. Um, but I haven't been haven't been contacted by them. I haven't been contacted by people to do any real world Klingon, other than using Klingon for real world things. And what I mean by that is, uh, for example, the uh, Air and Space Museum. The Smithsonian Air and Space Museum in DC, uh, you know, is where, where the original uh, TV enterprise model uh, lives. I think it lives there now. They're doing so much remodeling there at the moment. I don't know where it is. But anyway, they refurbished it a few years ago. Uh, and, it, and it's really nice if, if, if you were ever able to, to see it before the, the uh, museum kind of halfway shut down. And, and closed for the pandemic and all that. Um, and as part of all that, they, they got the idea, since, since they're making a big deal about the fact that the enterprise is gonna be on display not prominently on the main floor and so on, as opposed to hanging in the cafeteria where it was for years. Um, they decided that they should have a, a guide, an audio guide to the major exhibits there in Klingon that you, you download it on your phone or something. You can walk around the museum and hear a little description of the, of the various things in Klingon. I suppose they're doing it with other languages too, but I did the ones for, for Klingon. So you can read the description of, you know, Friendship 7 or whatever it is. Um, and also hear me talking about, it. I guess that's still active. I have, I have no idea. Uh, there's a blooper reel on YouTube of me making mistakes. Um, 
So I've done I've done stuff like that. There's been other things that other people have done, which is which is Klingon used for things other than Star Trek TV shows and and movies. Um, there was a tour given of, of public art in Pittsburgh a couple of years ago where the tour guys, Andrew Miller was the guy, um, conducted the entire tour in Klingon uh, for all the people, I guess, who wanted to hear about the public art in Klingon. Uh, for a while, there was a, you could go in Australia, there were these caves called the Janolan Caves. You can go on a tour of the cave. Uh, and you can get a, one of those sticks that you can get in museums where you can hear the, hear the, uh, the tour guy talking to you and you can choose whether you're here in French or whatever. And one of the choices was Klingon. They've upped, they've, they've redone that whole thing and Klingon is not a choice there anymore, which is too bad, but it was for a while. I didn't do that either. There's all these things I hear about. Uh, of course, there's the, you know, there's the Klingon plays, uh, there's the Klingon and opera, there's the Klingon opera. Which is ooh, which is means universe. It was not done for a Klingon TV show or a movie. Uh, I did work on the transit Klingon translation for that, but it's a totally separate production, but done by a little theater company in the Netherlands. There's been the annual performances of a Klingon Christmas Carol, not this year, uh, meaning this Christmas past, um, but for the last ten or whatever years before that, um, that wasn't done by me either. It's done by other people. It's great. So there's things done in Klingon that are not done specifically for for Hollywood. I know there's also Klingon in you know in the Big Bang Theory and stuff like that too. But but for non Hollywood things, it comes up from from time to time. Uh, it says here in the novelization for Star Trek: The Motion Picture, there was a Vulcan word. I guess it's supposed to be Tyla. That means close friend. Was that word your invention or Gene Roddenberry since it's never spoken on screen? It was certainly not mine because my involvement in Star Trek post dated Star Trek, the motion picture. Uh, whether it was Gene Roddenberry's or the novelists or, or somebody else's, some other you know, uh, participant in the film, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Here's a question. Does Paramount own Klingon? The question says. Uh, the short answer to that is no. The long answer to that is a long answer. Uh, and, and there's, and there's not, a, not a lot of time here. Uh, the reason the short answer is no, the real answer is, is nobody knows if anybody can own a, a, a language or a constructed language or not. This is not settled law. Um, one way or the other, uh, as a practical matter, nobody owns any of these things. Computer languages are different, but, but for spoken languages, constructed languages like Klingon or, or Dothraki or Navi or any of these things, uh, it's not clear. Now, Paramount has the copyright to the lines that were done for the film and for the TV shows. But that's different from owning the words and owning the vocab, owning the grammar and stuff like that. So it's, it's totally unsettled law. There was a lawsuit. This is why it's a long story that I'm not going to get into right now just because of, of the length. But uh, related to Axanar, which is the fan film that, that had, had a lawsuit, Sarah Paramount sued the makers of Axanar and they don't do that. And it went around and around in court for a while. And the end of it is they're making it, but in a modified form. But part of all that was involved, uh, can, can, can someone copyright a language? And if so, who has the copyright to cling on? And the way the suit went, it never got far enough for that question to be answered one way or the other. So we don't know. Uh, certainly I do not own Klingon. I do not believe Paramount owns Klingon. I don't believe anybody owns Klingon as a language, as a system, okay? The individual lines in Klingon is another story. Individual works in Klingon is, an, is another story. Uh, I hear someone who says, I hope to see a Klingon Christmas Carol. I hope you get able to see it too. It's, it's really good. So I hope they're able to, after all this settles down, <clears throat> they're able to mount it again somewhere. It's been, it's, it's been performed in, I don't know, five or six different cities. It used to, it started off in St. Paul, 
then it was only in Chicago, but it's also been in LA, well, just outside of LA in Simi Valley. Uh, it's been in Cincinnati. It was one night here in DC. I got to be Scrooge. I'm not sure I'm ever gonna do that again. Anyway, um, did I have anything to do with the Klingon opera? I mentioned that already. Yeah, yeah, I did the translation for the Klingon opera. It was written, the, the, the libretto was originally written in English, not in Dutch, even though it was a Dutch production. Uh, uh, and I tried, did the translation of the Klingon. And then we also did an expanded version of the libretto in book form called Pakbak, as the name of the book, which means, which means honor book in bad Klingon, but it came up in a next generation episode somewhere. So we had to do the bad grammar, uh, which is an expanded version of the libretto. It's the libretto plus stuff before that and after that the story. And the story is, is the founding of the Klingon empire with Kalos the unforgettable and he defeats the mighty Molar and links up with Lucara and all that stuff that everybody knows. Uh, do you expect to be working with Ethan Peck on Strange New Worlds? Do I expect to be? I don't know if I expect to be or not. Um, bum, bum, bum. Someone says, I saw Macbeth in Klingon. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't know Macbeth was ever done in Klingon. The, um, because of the line in, in Star Trek VI that you can't appreciate Shakespeare, <coughs> Shakespeare you've read in the original Klingon, the members of the Klingon Language Institute, which is the, the people uh, who study the language a lot and speak it well and produce various works of literature and Klingon and songs and everything else, uh, they decided, well, if Shakespeare was originally written in Klingon, we owe it to the world, to the galaxy, to not to translate, but to restore all the works of Shakespeare back to the original Klingon. And they started with Hamlet. Uh, they've also done much ado about nothing. The Romeo and Juliet has made progress. I don't know, I don't know what stage it's in. I don't know of anyone actually doing Macbeth, although it's the one that makes a lot of sense from a Klingon point of view. To the best of my knowledge, no one has ever performed any of these things in their entirety. Uh, there's been scenes of Hamlet that I've seen performed in various places. Uh, but not, not the whole play start, start to finish. There was another Dutch company, not the one who did the opera, a different Dutch theater company who put together a play uh, recently, about a year ago, uh, called Moo, 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 Moo is Klingon for words, 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 which is a line from, from Hamlet. And the way that play came about is they discovered that there was such a thing as the, as the Klingon version of Hamlet and that got them to thinking about language and words and plays and everything else. So the, this Dutch theater company, well, at least four members of it came to one of the conventions of the Klingon Language Institute and participated in everything and did activities and learned stuff, all this background research so they could make this play that was good. Uh, the jumping off point of which was, was the Klingon Hamlet. Well, it turns out that it was partly that uh, and it was partly another play, a German play called Hamlet Machine, which is one of the strangest plays I've, I've never seen it, but no one of the strangest plays I've ever read. It's a short play, uh, which is not, again, the story of Hamlet, but the characters from Hamlet. So Hamlet is in it and Ophelia, but it's really the actors playing Hamlet who get tired of playing Hamlet and can't separate the actor from the character and, and things like that. It's, it's very, very bizarre. So it's, a, and then and they, they hired uh, Levin Litar in Germany to translate Hamlet machine from German into Klingon. So it was a combination of the Klingon Hamlet and the Klingon Hamlet machine and their own ideas. There would be this, woo, woo, woo. And, it, and it opened in the Netherlands about a year ago and it was gonna travel around mostly in the Netherlands, three or four or five cities there and also into uh, uh, Antwerp in Belgium. And I was all set to fly over there and, and see it. And then COVID came along, play got canceled, flights got canceled. So I've never seen it. All I ever saw was kind of a little trailer that they made for it. And then in the trailer, they include uh, some footage that they shot at the, the Klingon Language Institute convention, where they interviewed a lot of the, a lot of the members and, inter and interviewed me. So you hear me in this little preview saying tach, 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 bet. I think that's what I'm saying. I think that's the line that they picked over and over and over again. All right, so I'm seeing we're running out of time here. Uh, there's this uh, 
Discord thing where I'll, I'll try to get over 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 to that afterwards. If, if anyone wants to go into that, I haven't tried it yet, but I, I, I'm told I have all the proper authorizations and codes and so on and so forth. Uh, so the latest things I'm doing that have anything to do with Star Trek Klingon or, or any other language are things like this, uh, doing some, some classes. I mean, I'm not teaching the classes, but I'm kind of a guest speaker in classes at a couple of universities uh, and, and even high school kinds of things, which is, which is fun. So that's what I'm doing. Uh, coming up in June, no, March, April, I don't know, coming up soon is the 20th anniversary of Atlantis, the film of Atlantis, the Disney, Disney cartoon that I made up the, the, the language for. And there's a big online get together uh, for, for something just to celebrate that, that I'm participating in. I don't know what that means. <laughs> I don't know who else is going to be there. Maybe some of the animators and directors and all that kind of stuff. There's all people I haven't had any uh, direct contact with for 20 years. So if that happens, you know, that'll, that'll be a lot of fun. Uh, last question down here it says, it says, have I considered creating Klingon sign language? Uh, I thought about it when I, when I started working on, on Klingon, I was very heavily involved in the deaf community in Washington DC because my main job at the time was closed captioning. So I was, I was, knew a lot, a lot of deaf people and was signing with them and so on and so forth. And they were all kind of disappointed with me that I made Klingon be a spoken language instead of a signed language. Uh, on the other hand, it wasn't my choice. <laughs> I was hired, hired to do this job. There's little bits of elements of, of ASL grammar in Klingon in, in a kind of subtle way, but there's no sign language as such. Somebody did a, a study about Klingon body language, which is kind of interesting. I think it was some, an Italian person did that. Anyway, we are uh, out of time. Thank you everybody uh, for, for joining me. If you wanna go over to the discard room, I'll, I'll try to be there uh, and have a good time wherever you are in this strange and virtual far point. So thank you. <laughs>